Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Thursday, February 11th, 2021. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the latest film and TV news. My name is Ben Pearson. I'm the senior writer at SlashFilm.com, and I'm joined on today's episode by Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. And writers Huay Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hi. All right, HT, let's talk about this. This is the thing that uh, the internet was all ablaze talking about last night. Uh, Disney made a a big decision about uh, a piece of casting in the Star Wars universe. What happened? Yes, Lucasfilm has cut ties with Gina Carano, who plays Cara Dune in The Mandalorian. Uh, In a statement from Lucasfilm, uh, they said that Gina Carano is no not currently employed by Lucasfilm, and there are no plans for her to be in the future. Nevertheless, her social media posts denigrating people based on their cultural and religious identities are abhorrent and unacceptable. And this is in reference to a recent post that Gina Carano posted on her Instagram story, uh, which has been widely deemed uh, anti-Semitic, and she has had many other brushes with uh, criticism against her social media posts, uh, such as some transphobic Uh, posts in which she made fun of people's preferred pronouns and anti-mask rhetoric, as well as uh, voter fraud. um, Unsubstantiated unsubstantiated voter fraud claims. claims. Yes. (laughs) And uh, this comes uh, uh, amid calls from fans for Gina Carano to be fired after all of these social media posts have, after she she doubled down on these social media posts, essentially. Um, And it also comes in light of um, the... Disney apparently planning to announce her as the star of a new Star Wars show in December at the Investors Conference, but which they backtracked on after her uh, November posts about the anti-mask and uh, voter fraud uh, claims. So it seems like she will no longer be a part of the Star Wars universe, according to Lucasfilm, and um, probably not part of Mandalorian Season 3, which is uh, expected to begin production in uh, April. So that's it seems like the last we've seen of her has will be Mandalorian Season 2. Uh, Jacob, what do you make of this? What I make of this is that there is a... Yes, free speech exists, and part of free speech means you can say what you want, but also means a company can fire you for your choice to say and double and triple down on saying truly hurtful, terrible things, uh, dangerous things even. And Disney has always been a company with its eye with with its eyes on generations. I mean, they were uh, they think in dollar signs. Those dollar signs are who's buying our stuff and watching our stuff for the next twenty years instead of the last twenty years. And the writing is on the wall. Gina Carano. as the internet made clear, this stuff doesn't fly, and the, and she has a right to say, it, and Disney has a right to fire her, and Star Wars won't miss her, straight up, and that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, um, Chris, uh, do you have any thoughts about this? I feel like you mentioned something in our Slack about James Gunn that I thought was a a, a trenchant observation. I don't remember what I said, Ben. So you're I think gonna... it was <laughs> something along the lines of uh, Disney fired James. They like wasted zero time in firing James Gunn off of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three for stuff that was clearly jokes. And this has been, you know, Gina right. Carano like has James. Has this, yeah, James Gunn was clearly telling jokes, and not only that, but these were those were like old jokes that he had long since expressed regret over and apologized for. Whereas Gina Carano has been doubling down on her bullshit for months now. It's it's not like this was like out of the blue and Disney was like, well, that's enough of that. They, If anything, Disney waited too long to f- fire her. Like, look, I, I, uh, I love the movie Haywire starring Gina Carano, but she is clearly uh, <laughs> not the best person. So, uh, you know, like, like Jacob said, you know, free speech is not a free speech means you can say whatever you want and the government can't come to your house and arrest you and and throw you in jail for it. And no one's doing that to Gina Carano. She's just losing her job. Like if you walk into your office of your manager and call him an asshole, he's, he has a right to fire you. Like, you know, that, you know, that's just the way the world works. No one, no one is entitled to earning a big fat Disney paycheck. So Mm -hmm. all these, all these, you know, calls of, you know, cancel culture and freedom of speech it really doesn't apply and i know no one no one rational believes that and I, you know I, i'm like you know preaching to the choir here like there's no like right winger who's going to listen to this and be like 
by Joe, Chris is right. I finally, <laughs> I've been, you know, I've seen the error of my ways. Like I know that's never going to happen, but it's, you know, it's worth repeating. You know, freedom of speech means you can say what you want and not go to jail for it. It doesn't mean you can't suffer consequences for being a deliberately shitty person. And that's what's yeah. happening here. Yeah, I think uh, I saw a tweet last night that was like, man, Gina Carano, uh, all she really had to do was just keep her mouth shut and just keep delivering 20 takes of some variation of these blast doors won't hold. And she could have just like kept, you know, making Star Wars money for God knows how long. And HD, it's really interesting that that Disney was like very close to essentially announcing her as the lead of that spinoff show. And I think a lot of people assumed that she was going to be playing a big part in that. Um, and now that looks like a, a sort of a smart part, uh, you know, a smart decision on Disney's part to, to not uh, specifically tie her name um, to that show because they could just now be like, oh, yeah, we were never planning on including her or building this show around her when, you know, they'll just uh, quietly introduce somebody else or, or sort of shift the story away from that. So, uh, yes, that is that. Uh, let, let's talk about some positive Pedro Pascal related news. And that is uh, some some new casting for The Last of Us TV show. Uh, Chris, tell us about that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey, who, uh, well, actually both of them were on Game of Thrones, are the leads of The Last of Us TV series based on the the very bleak post-apocalyptic uh, video game. Um, and yeah, that's that's really the whole the whole story right there. They're they're going to play the leads of the show, and everyone seems very happy about this. Uh, I haven't played the game, so I, I can't weigh on that front. And uh, but Pedro Pascal, great actor. I'm always happy to see him get more roles. I do think it's interesting that this is like the second TV show in a row where he's playing uh, a grizzled character who's protecting a child. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what that's about, but yeah, the, so there we have it. Uh, Chris, have uh, you seen Prospect, the science fiction movie where he plays a grizzled criminal on an alien planet protecting a child? I have not. Maybe that's just, <laughs> he's really into that. He's, you know, he's found his niche and that's what he wants to do. And, you know, more power to him. I just want to um, mention my very bad tweet uh, in which I said Pedro Pascal is now ex- pivoting exclusively to daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he really is. Uh, what Jacob, so I... What a night for Pedro Pascal. Sorry, Ben, but in one night, he, he is free from working with Gina Carano ever again. Uh, he has a trans sister who he's proud of and no, no longer work with a transphobe. And he gets to lead a new HBO like major series. What a day to be Pedro Pascal. Like, how freeing and open his life must feel right now. Yeah, man. What a, Yeah, exactly. What a day. Uh, so, Jacob, I know that you've played this game or... or... Uh, are familiar with it at least um what do you think about this or both of these pieces of casting actually yeah uh, ben you and i have both played uh the last of us and we talked about it both on the show and off and it's an incredible game and it's a bleak game the world and the story is as dark as anything i've experienced in any medium any book any uh any movie it is it is as oppressive this world as court mccarthy's the road you know it's, it's that dark uh but the two leads in the game, uh, you know, played by voice actors who, who did mocap for the game, uh, really have so much heart and feel so real and are such, have such a powerful connection as characters that really keeps your head above the water. They, they really allow you to want to keep playing and want to see where you're going. You want to see those two characters survive and find mutual ground and understanding. And it's a really amazing father-daughter, you know, surrogate relationship that ends up evolving. So casting these characters correctly is vital because the world is... You don't want to spend time in the world. You want to spend time with these characters and hopefully they survive mm-hmm, in this world. Mm-hmm. And I think Pedro Pascal uh, is a tormented father figure, uh, is great casting. And Bella Ramsey, who is who is an absolute blast in Game of Thrones, uh, just like an incredible character who was like a one episode character who was so popular. They brought her back and gave her like an entire like larger role in the next season. And one of the great spoiler alert, Game of Thrones deaths of all time. Um, she's amazing. Yeah, she played uh, Leanna Mormont, for those of you who maybe don't instantly recognize the name. She's like the young uh, woman, the, the the young warrior from uh, Bear Island, I think it was. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, li- I love that they, it's a 14-year-old character and they cast an actual teenager as opposed to like trying to cast them in their 20s. It's, it's an actual father-daughter relationship in the show. And that to me is, is vital. Uh, ben, what do you think? You've also played the games. <sighs> Yeah, uh, I really like Bella Ramsey as uh, the Ellie character. I think that's a, a great piece of casting. I'm not completely sold on Pedro Pascal as Joel, though. I feel like Joel has sort of a... Um, the the games are, are sort of a cross-country game, and I think um, a lot of it is sort of like Pacific Northwest, like northern part of the country kind of vibe. But I, I feel like 
the character of Joel has like a Southern guy energy and, and not in a way where like he's wearing, you know, the the Confederate flag or anything, but like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's tough to describe Jacob, but do you know what I'm talking about? There's, there's yeah. sort of a Southern swagger to that character yeah, a little absolutely. bit. I mean, the opening scenes of the prologue of the massive is set in Austin. Joel is from Texas. And I, I, he definitely has a very specific Texas vibe throughout that entire game. So you're, you're, you're right. But at the same time, I, Pedro Pascal does not scream Texas, but he does scream "Sad Daddy" as a she. <laughs> yeah, so. and that's that's the the uh, conflict that I'm having internally is I feel like he can pull off the the sort of like haunted you know thousand yard stare kind of stuff really well, um, but like the the essence of the Joel character to me is so much like tied into his physicality and like that that sort of um, yeah like ineffable southernness a little bit, and I, I have not seen Pedro Pascal. Uh, do anything like that before that's not to say uh, that he can't do it and didn't you yeah. see kingsman 2 where he wore a cowboy hat isn't that <laughs> enough for you i actually turned off kingsman 2 at a, a point where uh i think it was julianne Moore like threw somebody into a uh, a meat grinder it's like, so bad. It's like really 20 bad. minutes in i was like this movie but sucks it's like so. seven hours long in it. <laughs> i remember thinking that he was really the only saving grace of that movie because he's so charming and after that i was like but he should get a movie where he's a lead in an actual good movie. <laughs> um, I mean, and and there's also the thing of like Pascal is is I think he's pushing up against the limits right now of maybe being overcast in things. Like he has been just looking at like if you look at the the tag for his name on Slash Films archives, he has popped up in a ton of stuff over you know been cast in a ton and ton of things over the past you know, let's say 12 months or something. He's got like several big, big projects coming out soon. And then he also obviously just started Wonder Woman 1984. That was a very big high profile role. So I, I just, I worry a little bit about like uh, people sort of getting sick of him for lack of a better term. That that happens a lot where actors get hot and then they suddenly get cast in everything. And I feel like it's a really, it's a fine line to walk to like uh, give the people what they want in terms of like, you know, showing up and stuff, but not maybe oversaturating the market. <laughs> um, I feel like several actors have have had that happen. Uh, like are Jennifer Lawrence. That, are is you probably... saying that Pedro Pascal is threatening to be Jude Law in 2004? Yeah, exactly. Like, and and I was going to say Jennifer Lawrence, but yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great example. He, I mean, it just seemed like, you know, he had like a movie a month. I mean, I know it wasn't that much, but it just seems like it. And sometimes that can happen in pop culture stuff where somebody, you know, just pops up over and over again. I guess it helps that he's mostly hidden behind a mask in the Mandalorian. So um, maybe that will sort of ease the, uh, the oversaturation uh, uh, aspect a little bit, but anyway, just, just some thoughts. So I, I, I look forward to the show. I think it's going to be great. And uh, Craig Mazin, who, who is a, I mean, has, has proven to be a, a terrific writer is, is one of the um, people behind the show. And he is also working with uh, Neil Druckmann who like created the games and essentially like, you know, was like the, the uh, narrative architect for uh, both the last of us and the last of us part two. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing how they uh, adapt that game into a TV show. And, and uh, I'm yeah, very curious to see if Peter Pascal can sort of capture that Southern swagger, or if they just go in a, a sort of a different direction with the Joel character. But um, speaking of Craig Mazin, uh, he also is the writer of a uh, video game adaptation of the, Bo- or I'm sorry, a movie adaptation of the video game Borderlands. Uh, Chris, tell us about the latest with the Borderlands movie uh yeah so jack black is joining the cast as a robot named claptrap and it's a sarcastic robot so this is this is pretty good casting and uh this also makes borderlands a kind of house with the clock in its walls reunion because eli roth is directing it and kate blanchett has already been cast in it and uh jack black and kate blanchett were both in House of the Clock and its Walls, which was also directed by Elia Roth. And uh, Kevin Hart and Jamie Lee Curtis are also in the movie, too. So it's a very weird cast, but a very interesting one, too. Uh, Jacob, I know you're familiar with the Borderlands uh, universe. What do you think about uh, Jack Black as Claptrap? It's so obvious that it has to be. It was inevitable. If they were going to make this movie, it would be Jack Black. Uh, I, I was joking to my wife because I, I play Borderlands 3 once or twice a week with with, with friends online. Our, it's it's one, of our, one of our pandemic games. And we, we've been just watching this casting with very amused because many of these characters are also in Borderlands 3. And my wife was very interested in Claptrap because he's this very adorable looking robot uh, with like sort of a foul mouth and like a 
like weird sense of humor. So I described him as Wally with with, like meets Deadpool. And it's kind of what Jack Black will be playing here. You have an idea of what Claptrap is. Uh, This cast is really wild. I I think Eli Roth's is the thing I'm I'm really hesitant about because I'm not sure he can handle like a big sci-fi action movie. Like Like I said, it's essentially Mad Max on Alien Planet is what Borderlands is. Uh, but Kevin Hart, Jack Black, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Kate Blanchett essentially Mad Maxing with machine guns across an alien planet, fighting monsters and bandits. Uh, well, I I can't I, don't, I can't even begin to describe what, that this is going to be a weird, wild thing if it even <laughs> approximates what the games feel like, which is this comic book Looney Tunes nonsense in a good way. Uh, I don't, I really want to hear from HT. She's been quiet on this one, HT. As a person who doesn't play a lot of video games, does this cast, uh, does it light up anything in you, especially knowing that Jack Black's playing a sarcastic robot? I do love the idea of Jack Black as as a sarcastic robot. I don't know anything about Borderlands apart from what you've told me, but I probably will tune in or, you know, buy a ticket to watch uh, Jack Black Black play a sarcastic robot. (laughs) All right. So let's talk about uh, animation a little bit. HBO Max uh, seems to be really uh, making a big push toward um, adult animation or, or uh, animation aimed at adults. Um, I think Rick and Morty is, is streamable there as is South Park and uh, several other things, but um, they just announced yesterday that they are doing uh, or confirmed rather that they're doing a uh, modern refresh of clone high, which is a cult classic animated series from the early two thousands that was created by uh, Bill Lawrence from scrubs and uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who, um, have you know done everything from the Jump Street movies to the Lego movie and and uh, the the Last Man on Earth, a ton of other stuff. Um, HBO Max has already given it a two season order, and we the we don't know any details uh, about exactly whether the same characters are going to be coming back or whatever. Um, but we do know that uh, Lord and Miller are going to be on board as writers for the show, and the original showrunner is going to be coming back too. So I feel like that consistency, for people who watch Clone High, this has to be a huge deal. I was not one of those people. I've never seen Clone High. I know about it just because um, you know it, it has that Lord and Miller thing to it where like everybody in you know a very specific uh, type of comedy circle like uh, is... Uh, looks at looks upon it with reverence, but I've never seen it. So I wanted to, to open up the floor and see if you guys uh, watch the show or have any uh, fond memories of it. Chris, I think you shared the theme song in our Slack. Did you watch this show uh, like all the way through? Uh, I don't know if I watched MTV shows were weird because their seasons would be like, they would have like a bunch of episodes and then the show would like disappear for like seven years. And then the next few seasons would arise. So I can't remember if I watched all of this, but um, I do remember watching it when it was on like this and Daria were like the two MTV animated shows that I I love to watch. And I remember this being very funny. Uh, I remember like, like you mentioned, Ben, that theme song really slaps and I'm, I'm a little upset because the theme song specifically mentions the eighties and they're not gonna be able to get, make that work for this version because it's modern day. So Mm. teenagers aren't born in the eighties anymore because I, that's, a sad realization and I'm very old right now. So they're going to have to alter the theme song a little bit, which depresses me because the theme song is so fucking cool, but I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, HT is a big animation fan. Have you ever dipped your toe into the clone high waters? No, I actually hadn't heard of clone high until this news story broke. I just totally missed. I mean, I think I was a little too young for all of the MTV animated shows. And then I just kind of missed them completely. I only mm-hmm. know of Daria through like, pop culture osmosis so this one i completely uh skipped by i'm sorry i give a really really boring answer i have no idea <laughs> no it's fine i was just curious um jacob do you have any relationship to that original series i'm a similar boat as chris in that it was very hard to keep track of mtv shows at all in that area it was you know pre-streaming pre you know vod if you miss things you miss them and, and mtv had a habit of burying things especially shows like clone high that had a passionate following but weren't huge hits but this was a this was Lord Miller before they were Lord Miller. You know, it's, it's the introduction of their voice in many ways. You can, you can see it all throughout it and all over it. So I think this is my good excuse to finally dive back in and watch all of it to get ready because what I did see was great. Yeah, and there's a bunch of other announcements that I won't like run through here, but I encourage you to read because there are several like new shows that HBO Max uh, announced and then some, some more that are in development. Um, 
Uh, there's a show called Velma that is an origin story of the Scooby-Doo detective character. It's going to be voiced by Mindy Kaling. Um, Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live is going to be voicing a character on a show called Fired on Mars, which is set on the Martian campus of a modern tech company. Um, so yeah, there, there are several other things here that might be uh, up your alley if you're into animation that, like I said, is sort of like aimed at adults instead of kids. So if you want to check that out, you can click on the link in the show notes and read more about that. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about a different HBO project, and that is uh, True Detective, which I th- kind of thought was like dead and buried, but it seems like it's potentially going to be resurrected. Chris, what's the latest in the True Detective world? Uh, well, I've cracked this case, Ben, and by that I mean I read someone else's story and reported ah. on that. But, <laughs> but HBO uh, HBO chief content officer Casey Bloys announced that they're working with new writers to find, um, quote, the right tone and take on a potential uh, new season of True Detective. And while they don't come out right out and say that, that really sounds like Nick... I don't know how to pronounce his name. Nick Pizzolato. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Yes, that. I think that's right. But the basically the guy who created the series and, and wrote most of the episodes, it really sounds like he's not going to be involved with the fourth season, which really makes sense because there's a lot of, you know, nothing is confirmed, but there's a lot of gossip and hearsay that he's kind of difficult to work with. He's one of those really uh, dead set on his ways artists where he doesn't like compromise on anything. And while, I understand that it, you know, TV is really a medium that that benefits from different voices, and he seems to be one of those TV showrunners who doesn't want to hear from anyone else, and he only wants his vision to be executed. So, if the show is to move forward, it probably needs you know that that new blood behind the scenes, sort of like guiding it along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Jacob, do you have any thoughts about uh, True Detective? Did, did you? I don't remember if you watched the third season that had uh, Mahershala Ali and few other people in it did you watch that i did and i liked it and it's such a weird thing i think the first season of true detectives one of the best single seasons of tv ever made and it it was was no secret as chris alluded to that on that set director carrie joji fukunaga who directed the whole series clashed hard with pizzolato over creative control and that clashing of people who really hated each other ended up creating something really really great uh but for the seasons two and three pizzolato you know refused to work with fukunaga again brought in rotating directors instead of, you know, single directors for the whole seasons. And the results were, you know, never as good. Sometimes that clash is what you need. You need somebody in the room with you to say yes and no and to push back. And even though the pushback on that show kind of scenes was very turbulent, it made for something extraordinary. And it's, it's in considering that Vizzolato then made a deal with FX and that fell through before he even make anything, it's becoming increasingly clear that he's a guy who wants that creative control but doesn't play well with anyone. And that's a shame because... Clearly, when he had that temperamental partner who brought out the best in him somehow, even though they fought, it led to truly great television. And at the same time, I think that a, a, an HBO series where each season is detective solving crimes, it still works. If they can find you know rotating people to come in and do seasons where it's like, yep, let's find a new case, two new detectives, bring them in, solve it, wrap it up, let's move on to another season. There's still a lot of gas in that. So mm-hmm. even without, Pizzol- I don't think Pizzolatto is necessary. I think they just need, HBO has the power and the money to hire the best and they should do that. Yeah. HT, I feel like you might have like a galaxy brain take that like season two is the best season, even though it was like notoriously derided or something. Do you Why have like you some sort of take on me? <laughs> because I, you know, like Vince Vaughn is daddy or some crazy thing. I feel like you would H- just. <laughs> HT, you like crap. Don't you like season two? <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I mean. I'm I just kidding. Mean, like, I'm kidding. <laughs> Season two, it's I mean, terrible. <laughs> I, oh, you, that's the last okay. season I watched. And um, Chris, I, I'm the HT. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm the season two defender. I'm quoted on the DVD box. Are you oh really? My God. I, I, was, I would say season two is not as bad as everyone makes it out to be, but it's not great either. I was reviewing it for Esquire at the time, and my, well, it's and Esquire is quoted on the Blu-ray and DVD box. So I'm pretty sure it's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, I, I, HT. I did not mean to like impugn your uh, your journalistic integrity or your tastes or anything. I just I feel like the Vince Vaughn of it all is something that might like uh, might have attracted you, but it sounds like you weren't as a, a fan of that season at all. Anyway, you so. know, I'm also not that big of a Vince Vaughn fan. I don't know where you get that from. 
Well, it's just the randomness of it. It yeah. seems like that <laughs> it does kind of seem uh, like me. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So let's see. From from one HBO, or I mean, I, most of this episode seems to be talking about HBO related stuff. But uh, another HBO related announcement is the uh, House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones prequel show. They have cast four more lead actors um, to to join that series, and I just wanted to run through a couple of the characters here, um, especially since I have Jacob on this episode. I know he and I are both like diehard Game of Thrones fans, and I just wanted to get uh, Jacob. I wanted to get your take on this. Um, so the the actors who have joined this show are uh, Steve Toussaint, Eve Best. Uh, Reese Ifans and uh, Sonoya Mizuno. Um, not exactly like household names, but several of these people you would recognize from a bunch of other stuff. Like Mizuno, for example, was just in Devs, the um, Alex Garland show that was on uh, FX. So like you might not recognize her name, but you, you would know her stuff. Um, so th- the character really that Jacob that I wanted to, to highlight here is uh, Lord Corliss Valerion, who is also known as the Sea Snake. And uh, this is the show that takes place 300 years before the events of Game of Thrones, um, the the original series. So it's not going to have any uh, specific crossover um, with any of those characters. But this uh, this uh, house Valerion is not a house that I'm familiar with, um, but it is a Valerian bloodline that is as old as House Targaryen. And the Sea Snake is the most famed nautical adventurer in the history of Westeros. Uh, he, the description says he built his house into a powerful seat that is even richer than the Lannisters and that claims the largest navy in the world. Um, what do you think about this, Jacob? Are you excited to see uh, what what this new sort of um, sliver of uh, Westerosi history looks like? Yeah, I think this is really cool. I think Atusant is a really cool actor. You've seen him in a lot of things. He's look at IMDb. You've probably seen him in something. And I guess after so many people criticized the original Game of Thrones run for not having any people of color, like in Westeros, they're all rele- relegated overseas to the exotic Essos. Uh, an exotic in quotation marks there, clearly. <laughs> um, to see a a a character who's a, a powerful, wealthy lord in Westeros being played by a black actor feels like a very not so quiet reaction <laughs> to the original run, especially since there are brand new showrunners on this prequel and the original two are not involved, especially with a uh, Sonoya Mizuno as well. Yeah. Uh, it just feels, it feels like they're, they're recognizing, Oh, just because this world is based on medieval England doesn't mean you have to cast like it's medieval England. So mm-hmm. um, I think this is really promising. I mean, I, I think he's the one that stands out in terms of character description immediately had my interest, but also I will never say no to my man, Reese Fons, who I've loved since Notting Hill. HG, you sound like a, a Reese Fons fan. Am I right about this one? I, you, you are right about that. I am a big Reese Fons fan. That was the one, the name that um, made my ears perk up. I was like, oh, he's in this. Maybe I should watch it. Uh, I've been burned by Game of Thrones before, though, so I don't know if I would trust them, but it is uh, encouraging to see them cast uh, outside of the uh, t- the generic sort of white European um, the standard they've been going by for the past eight seasons of game of thrones mm-hmm. so and sonoya mizuno too i really like her she has also collaborated a lot with alice garland she was in Anni- annihilation as the um sort of c- the double uh, of natalie portman and uh in x oh really too. i don't think i realized that yeah she she the played part- the like the silver yeah. thing at the very end of that movie she did so wow. fun fact that's cool yeah because she's a dancer so um i'm excited to see um that I don't know. Maybe I'll tune in because I am getting more interested based on this casting than I am on the story because I'm kind of I don't really need more Westeros stuff. I said on before before on this podcast I just want to see more Essos, more um, ancient uh, Valir like Valyria stuff. So mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I am I am interested. Yeah, and your beloved Matt Smith is also a character in this he HT. Is. So. And I feel like the, the, well too. the draw might be too great for you to turn this one down. Let's so. check out the first couple episodes, maybe. <laughs> um, Jacob, you mentioned uh, Benioff and Weiss, the, the former showrunners of Game of Thrones. And uh, I wrote a story today about they have a new show set up at Netflix. It's called The Overstory. And it's based on a, I think, 2018 book that won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for fiction. HD, have you read that book by any chance? Do, do you, are you familiar with The Overstory at all? I can't say I am. Okay. Jacob, have you read it? I know you're a big reader as well. I uh, know this one took me completely off guard. I've never heard of it. 
It sounds really cool. Um, the, the description is, uh, Netflix describes it as a sweeping, impassioned work of activism and resistance that is also a stunning evocation of the natural world. It tells the story of a world alongside ours that is vast, interconnected, resourceful, magnificently inventive, and almost invisible to us. A handful of disparate people learn how to see that world and are drawn into its unfolding catastrophe. Um, so it, it sort of sounds like it has a, an environmentalist uh, bent to it um, and you know, it seems to be a little bit of, of a pivot for these Game of Thrones showrunners. So if you want to learn more about that show and the people involved with it, um, I encourage you to click the link in the show notes. But I think that's going to bring us to the end of this edition of Slash Film Daily. You can find more about all of the stories that we mentioned on today's show at SlashFilm.com and linked inside the show notes of this episode. Slash Film Daily is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe to the show on uh, Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps, and send us your feedback, questions, comments, and concerns at peter at slashfilm.com. Make sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word. Thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you all tomorrow.